At Indie Book Source, you can shop by genre or by author, and you will be buying direct from the author's main purchase link. We offer hundreds of titles and formats that include ebooks, paperback, hardbound, and audiobook. Support an indie author. Visit IndieBookSource.com today. Welcome to Meet the Author, where you can join in on insightful conversations with best-selling and award-winning indie published authors. Your hosts today are Rob and Joan, who themselves are indie published authors, book publicists, and paranormal investigators with Tampa Bay Spirits, based in Tampa Bay, Florida. Thanks for dropping by. And now, on with the show. Hi, I'm Rob. And I'm Joan. How are you this evening, everybody? I'm so glad that you're watching us, whether you're watching us live or listening to us on any of the many channels that we podcast on. We're glad that you've joined us. I do want to remind everybody that we broadcast on six channels. Three of them are Facebook. One is LinkedIn, and we have two YouTubes. And if you're in, you're on one of those channels, the people that are on the other channels won't necessarily hear or see your comments. So we put them up and that's why you're not seeing those because right. a lot of people get confused. About please that. go ahead and comment. Yeah. And especially if you're on, uh, if you're on LinkedIn and your name may not show up, we might have to ask you what your name is, but you don't have to give it. Yeah. That's okay. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> All right. And so Trish Pickens already says, hello. Hello, Trish. Trish is just, Purchased a new house, everybody. Yay. So she might miss a few shows. <laughs> She's going to be a busy girl. C.W. Hawes Hello, is Chris. in the house. Hi, Chris. He says, hi, guys. Joe Conjol says, hi, Rob and Joan. More about Hello, Joe, Joe towards the end of the show. Yeah, We've got we'll a little bit with of you, news. Yeah, we got something to say him. about you. <laughs> Paul Hollis says, hi, Joan and Rob. Hey, Paul. Hi, Paul. Glad that you're here. And Caleb Pertle hey, says, Caleb. anxious to hear the man who gazes at stars. And boy, oh, he does. Oh, too. my gosh, Caleb. He is so interesting. He has won awards. He's seen more. He's discovered more supernovae okay. than anybody else. Okay, I'm we sorry. Will. I am excited <laughs> about it, though. And those of you who know me well know I'm all about that. Trish says she's a tide girl, LOL. I bet she is. And Joe Conjol says, congrats, Trish. And George Dismuke says, okay, I'm here. And about half the cast of Siren Song plus Whoa, my cool. publisher. Yay. Well, welcome, welcome, everybody. Welcome to the whole gang and crew. A little bit more about them later, too. After there you go. George is one of our sponsors. And we're going to have a little chat after one of yeah, or some two news, of his some commercials. Exciting news. Some exciting news. Yes, yeah. yes. But we're not going to tell you right now. Uh -huh. Trish says, thank you for the congratulations. Well, well, why don't we get <laughs> introducing okay. our guest the person tonight. that we're here for. <laughs> he is an author, and he's much more than an author. He's oh, an man. author plus. Tom mm -hmm. Bowles is his name, and he's over in uh, England. He's in Suffolk, uh, England. And Tom is a fellow of the Royal Astronomical Society, and the past president of the British Astronomical Association. He's won the Merlin Medal and Walter Goodacre Awards for his contribution to astronomy. And he actually has a main belt asteroid number 7648 oh, that's named right. in his honor. That's right. Tumbles. Cool. Oh, which cool, is pretty it, cool. I don't have an asteroid named after me. No, I don't either. Mm -hmm. I don't think so. Mm -hmm. No, sure we probably know, wouldn't we? Yeah. yeah, I guess we would. At any rate, without much more ado, why don't we bring in our guest for the evening, Mr. Tom Bowles. Hello, Tom. Hi, Tom. Hello, Hello. everybody. Hello, it's John. Hello, Rob. Hello. Hello. It's very late at night where you're at. We appreciate you staying up so late. I was just thinking, after that brilliant introduction, I, I, <laughs> I can only disappoint people now. So no, I, I, I need no. to really concentrate and do a really good job here. So <laughs> thank you for that introduction, Rob. Terrific. Hey, everybody's it's flocking in here to, to see you. To see yeah. you. Uh, Caleb says, welcome to George and his cast of thousands. thousands. Yes. 
James, James Ricard. Ricard. Hello, I James. I haven't seen you for a while. How are you doing? Hey, guys. Almost didn't make it. Glad you did. You're in Glad for you a did. treat. You slid into home. Uh -huh. And then Ghislaine McCann says, waiting for my stargazer watching from Canada. There yeah, that's awesome. And Lonnie Becca Jones. Hey, how Hello, are Becca. you? Hello, everyone. Excited to be here. This is the Becca part of Lonnie and Becca Jones. There you go. I believe. That is true. Hello, everyone. Excited to be here. You don't know. Lonnie could be watching. Well, Lonnie could be watching. <laughs> I hope right. Lonnie's watching. That would be nice. Now, let's, why don't we talk to the person that came to here? Oh, that's right. He hasn't said a word yet. No. no. Well, well, he has. He said a couple of words, <laughs> yeah. like a disclaimer. <laughs> <laughs> So, Tom, tell us a little bit about yourself. Oh, well, as you've already said, I'm a, a, an author, an astronomer. Um, I, I guess I've got a little bit of history of how both of those things came about. Because, perfect, perfect. You know, I went to school when I was about 11, and it was, it was the afternoon, and it was in Glasgow. And you can tell by the accent, the accent <laughs> that I'm, I'm a little bit Scottish. Um <laughs> And it gets dark quite early in um, Glasgow in the winter time. So a friend in the class brought in this telescope, and he he let me have a look at Saturn and Jupiter. And there was a little cluster of stars called the Pleiades, the Seven Sisters. I had a look through his telescope at those, and I tell you, I was absolutely smitten. I just had to get one telescope. And, of course, I had no money at the time to get a telescope, so I used to make them up through sort of um, kitchen roll inner tubes and the cardboard things you get in the side, <laughs> spectacle lenses, and, and they worked quite well. So, you know, that that was pretty pretty successful. Well, I left school at 16, surprisingly enough, and I went and I did a, an apprenticeship with an optical company in Glasgow called Charles Franks, and they made astronomical telescopes. So I learned to make them, I learned to design them, wow. and I was there for five or six years. And then, of course, the, 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 the Japanese started to bring in cheap imports, and there's no way the company could compete with it. So it went down the plug hole. So I left that company and I joined a company that you may recognize, National Cash Register Company out of Dayton, Ohio. Yes. And, yeah. And I used to spend many, many months traveling between London and, and Dayton and, and business meetings. And I started off as a computer engineer and I worked my way up and I ended up on the board of NCR UK. So th that was a sort of pinnacle of my career. And I worked for a few other companies as well after that in sort of board level positions. But I, I took early retirement. And the idea of taking early retirement is I'd start doing what I really wanted to do, which was astronomy. So I moved out to Suffolk. I bought myself three automatic robotic telescopes and I set up an observatory and I started to look for supernovae. And you know, over a period of sort of 17, 18 years of doing that, I discovered about 155 supernovae. Wow. That's a lot. I've, I've got an entry in Wikipedia, and it says I've discovered 149, but it was another <laughs> six I discovered that never went through the official channels. So 155 is my discovery total in overall. So that, that led me into sort of becoming... <clears throat> And I joined the, the British Astronomical Association, ended up as a president. Then I got elected as a, a fellow of the Royal Astronomical Society. And then I went on several of their um, co uh, committees and stuff to help them run, the, run society. And I was an interface between um, professional astronomers and what I was as, as a, a semi-professional amateur. So it was acted as the interface between those two. So that, that worked quite well. And then um, the Royal Astronomical Society signed a, a contract with Cunard, and they were interested in having speakers on board the ships. So I volunteered to do that. 
and I've got a sign <laughs> of Queen Mary and the Queen Mary 2. What a wonderful ship that is. Majestic. It's not a cruise ship, it's an ocean liner. And okay. you know the difference between a cruise ship and an ocean liner? No. A, a, cruise, a cruise ship, the bridge is right up at the pointy end, right up at the bow. So as it's almost overlooking the bow. And an ocean liner, there's a big long space between the bow and the, and the bridge. And the idea of that is if you're at sea and there's high waves, the waves can break over the front of the ship without affecting the, the bridge. So That's interesting. Oh, that's interesting. Nice little bit of trivia there. So <laughs> Let me interrupt you a minute here. We've got a bunch of comments. Uh, Ken Stark. Hello, Ken hi, Stark. Ken. Welcome How aboard. are you? Yeah. Hi, Joan, Rob, and everybody. It's been a while since I've seen you. Uh, George Dismuke says he loves your accent. And then there's uh, a question for you. Have you been able to visit any famous observatories? Trish Pipkins has asked that one. Only in the UK and in Europe. I would love to come and do the, the, the astronomy observatory trail down California and Arizona. Yeah. The one in Griffin Park. I would really love to see the 200 inch at Mount Palomar because Palomar. that is. San Diego, I think. When I was growing up, that, that telescope was built in 1948, and it yeah. was the biggest telescope in the world the whole way through my sort of learning process. And even today, I look at that telescope with sort of relevance, you know. Uh, it, it's sort of better and bigger, well, not bigger, but it's, in my mind, I see it as a sort of really historical telescope. And it's... It's just get something in here for me when I see it and I look at it. And uh, it means more to me than some of the bigger ones. E even the Hubble Space Telescope and things like that, I'd, I'd rather see the 200 inch at Mount Palomar. Wow. Wow. You should come. I should come. I'll, I'll come someday and do it. But um, I'm not quite sure when. But, you know, I've used all these telescopes because when, when I make my discoveries, they need to be confirmed. They need to have things called spectra taken of them. That's the, they need to have the light split up so as they can tell what the stars are made of. And it, they need to get a spectrum so as they can actually prove that it is a supernova. So the 200 inches done it. Um, the two big kecks have done it. The Hubble Space Telescope's done it. I mean... There's nothing nicer than waking up in the morning and getting an email and saying, last night the Hubble Space Telescope had a look at your da da da, -da. Your supernova. It's <laughs> a type 1A, sort of four days after maximum, you know, and da da da. That, that's lovely, you know. And what's the new one now? They've after the Hubble, there's they launched there's the James Webb Telescope. Yeah. yeah. That is going to be something. I mean, it, I that was supposed to launch in 2018, so it's yeah. launched four years late. Late, yeah. But it, it's going to be worth every bit of the wait because I'm, I'm excited. Better late than not at all. Yeah, I guess, right? Bigger, bigger than the Hubble. Bigger than the Hubble can yeah, see. It further. uses a different form of light than the Hubble. Yes. It's using redder light, which means it can see further into the universe. So, you know, it's going to see right almost, well, not to the edge of the universe, but it's almost to the, the, when the first galaxies started to form. And that will be terrific because... It will be um, amazing. It will be absolutely amazing. And they reckon, you know, that they'll actually be able to do analysis of extrasolar planets. That's planets getting around other stars. And they'll uh -huh. be able to look at the atmospheres of those planets yeah, and detect whether life is there or not. Just by looking at the constituents of the atmosphere. You know, if you look at the atmosphere and you find oxygen, that's a sign that life's there. If you find methane, that's a sort of sign that life's there. So it's a whole. The the, the whole thing is just mind-boggling, and I, I reckon in the first year that it's active, it will make so many discoveries yeah. that it will boggle the mind completely. And Joe Conjol says, I've got an original Haley, Haley scope. It's, it's cool. not yeah. much as a telescope, but it's all mine. <laughs> <laughs> not quite the whole I don't I don't either. So 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 Tom, how did this uh, birth you into writing? 
into writing books. Books, because I know you know. wrote uh, scientific we papers. Maybe since this. Oh, I, I did scientific papers. I, I really, I need to go back to my dad, really. Oh. My dad, God bless his soul, is dead now, but he's had four or five different abortive attempts at writing a novel. And it was back in the days before computers. So there was no word processing or anything like that. And so he used to write his things out longhand in sort of school exercise books. And I, I, can, I can remember the front page of almost every one of his novels. And I always started off with the hero crossing a bridge in London and a deep um, pea super. A pea super was a slang word we used in London for really thick, unhealthy fog before yeah. they actually got the Clean Air Act running and cleaned it up. And, you know, it, it, it probably run on for sort of 20, 25 pages. Then he'd run out of puff. He had nothing else to write about. Because the man had never been to London. He'd never, he didn't know anything about the geography of London, nothing about the structure of the place. So he was trying to set a novel in a place where he'd never been. And he just didn't have the background. So, you know, when I started to write my novels, I thought, well, let's really stick and use the old adage, write about what you know. So I, I started to write about, not just about astronomy, but being an astronomer. And you know, one of the things I noticed is that if you're an astronomer and you go and meet other astronomers, they're very cooperative. They tell you things. They're eager, eager to tell you things. And, you know, I thought, you know, I, I, I could use that in a novel. If I had an astronomer going to some organization, he could speak to them, get them to speak back to him, and he could find information that an official investigator wouldn't be able to find out. So that's uh, where the idea came from. Okay. So I, I take my, I take my Brad Willis, my astronomer, and I put him into sort of scientific institutions to do investigations. And it seems to be working so far. So awesome. I'm pleased with the way it's turned out. This so that's basically where the motivation up. came from. Interesting. That that's the cover you've just put up. And if you yeah. look, look at it very closely, well, you don't need to do it that closely, but there's no A in dark. Yeah, I but noticed that. I treated the A for a lambda sign. And I'll let you into a little secret. Lambda is international astronomical symbol for dark energy. Ah, oh, no, a, a little link piece of knowledge you've got there. there for those go. of us who don't know, now we're in the know. And for those in of you know, who yeah. listening so, and you're not watching live and you're listening to the podcast, what he's talking about is the A in dark is not um, an A. It looks like an inverted B, V. Not what would an inverted <laughs> B look like? It's an inverted Crazy. V, <laughs> and that's the science symbol that he was talking about. Yeah, that's really cool. Now, this is a Brad Willis adventure, right? It is, is that indeed, his name? Yes. So Brad Willis must be the uh, the hero, and perhaps it might even be you. Well, my friends tell me that I, uh, Brad Willis is me on steroids. On steroids. <laughs> I, I haven't given Brad Willis any magical – well, he's, he's got a few – he's probably braver than I am. But I haven't given him any superpowers. So everything that Brad Willis does, I guess I can do it, to a lesser extent. You know, not so as um, – brilliantly or as flamboyantly as he does it but um everything that he does I, i'm associated with um there's a thread running through all of the books i'm writing and that is that his his first wife carol gets killed in a hit and run accident oh and he gets ptsd as a result because he was in the car when it happened and the trauma yeah. is there and he can see a face up close when when she died you know and his our vacant eyes stare at him and all this sort of thing yeah and um that that haunts him through the first two books certainly and um but it actually is an asset to him because when he gets stressed 
it, he gets the PTSD comes to the top, and he does sometimes does rash things, but the rash things that he does always gets him out of trouble. <laughs> so, sort of, you know, it's a, it's a godsend in a way. So there's a, there's a thread running through the books where he's trying to find the the red car which killed his wife and the driver of the red car, and so that's sort of. A, a, a background story running through it yeah awesome okay, we have stop. a bunch of comments let me get to them here and then we need to do our first commercial. then break. we need to go to commercial but joe conjol says uh, the haley scope came out in uh 1985 to 86 when haley's comet passed by and cw this was when you were talking about your dad and how your dad wrote books novels when he was writing uh, he says he still writes his novels longhand. Wow. Oh, CW. God bless I don't you. E <laughs> I don't even. Okay. Paul Hollis says it's a great cover, and it is. It's an it amazing is. color. Maybe Very cover. Maybe after the commercial, I'll put that back up, and we'll have Tom uh, explain to us what the cover means for those that are just listening to the podcast. George Dismuke said that was an editorial interjection from the canine gallery. And which that was our dog. I don't know barking. what our dog was barking yeah. at. And uh, Stuart, and oh, I'm going to ruin your name. Balburnie. Balburnie. Stuart Balburnie said it's a terrific read. He's read Dark Energy. He loves it. Good. And Good. Trish Pipkin. Hmm. Thank you, Stuart. And Trish Pipkin says, love that cover. And James Ricard says, no matter what, it's a cool cover. It is a cool cover. All right. Okay, we got through all that. <laughs> <clears throat> Let's hear from our sponsors now. Give them a chance to... to uh, a word? Well, we a word, word from, from our, our sponsors. Yeah. <laughs> Hold on. We'll be right back, guys. Just a short break. People who like to read want to get their hands on books by Becca Jones. Becca Jones, the breakthrough author who tells it like it is. It takes courage to tell a story when it reveals dark secrets. Becca Jones delves deep into the hidden world of sexual abuse. She tells what happened and also tells how she survived. Meant to be is much more than just entertaining. Meant to be gives you a point of reference hope to cling to and becomes a guide for survival if you have suffered the same thing meant to be becca jones a must-have meant to be is available on amazon barnes and noble and many other bookseller websites Still alive. Who's still alive? Maris. That's who. Come on, Angie. That's impossible. Impossible or not, she, she's still alive. I tell you, she killed that boatload of people, and she's just getting started. There's no limit to what she will do. It's not easy to kill a siren. It takes a formula and a plan. Siren Song Two is the spellbinding sequel to Siren Song. Both novels by George Dismukes. Siren Song 2 will be on bookshelves and bookseller websites in July. Don't miss it. Well, we're back. And we're as back. I said, we have a bit of news from one of our sponsors, and that is from George Dismukes. And here it is. The Siren Hunter. It's coming in January 2023. As you know, Siren Song 1 and Siren has already been out for a while. And Siren Song 2 is coming out, as you just heard on the commercial, in July. And this was going to be Siren Song 3. Three, however, after a long talk with his publisher, <laughs> Nancy Shoemaker, they decided to change the name for a couple of reasons. Number one, Siren Song Three sounded redundant somehow and a little tiresome, but far more importantly, it opens up the door for a franchise. 
and in consideration of the fact that all three books are destined to become movies, by naming the book The Siren Hunter, it creates an identity for a TV series. And I really like that idea. And plus, I'm going to put this picture up again. Okay, this actress name is Jamie Wilson, and Jamie plays actually my favorite character in the books, and she is the Siren Hunter. And that will launch, as we said, in January. And Jamie plays the role of Angie Holland, who really is a very dynamic figure and character in the book. I like her very much. And very much against her wishes, she's drawn into becoming the Siren Hunter. The photographer that did this beautiful picture is Mark Clark. So thank you, everybody. Okay. Back to you, Tom. Can't wait, that George. Fun, That's right? going to be great. It is. The movie should be coming out fairly soon, I think. Oh, <laughs> Jenny says, woohoo, looks great, George. Trish Pipkins said so exciting and Trish also said Angie is a great character she is a great she really is my favorite character in that series yeah, if, you, if you haven't started Siren Song start with Siren Song 1 and work your way up get on board before July <laughs> <laughs> yeah All right okay. okay let's get back to I wanted um, Tom for you to perhaps describe your cover of Dark Energy because a lot of people will listen yeah. to this as a podcast and they won't have any visual so it looks like there's a lot going on there there's a lot going on yeah i mean if you could imagine dark energies in big print right along the sort of center of the page and then my name and a brad willis adventure is down below it the picture is overall relatively dark there's a lot of grays in it and so the title is out printed in white um at the bottom half of the, the page, there's a few empty sort of um, ammunition cases to sort of suggest that, you know, sort of a, a gun's been fired and there's been weapons used. And in the background, there's an oil refinery, which is in fire, it's exploding, and there's helicopters circling around it. Um, so all of that takes place inside the book. Um, obviously, I can't tell you too much about it, or I'll be right. a, a complete spoiler. <laughs> but um, the the background shows the the, the tower of the oil refinery, um, the the orange and red flames and black smoke coming out of it, and um, the smoke rising up into the air. So um, it, it gives a feeling of being a thriller and being action packed, which which it is. Uh, there's a lot of action in my book. I sort of concentrate more on action than anything else. So it's pretty fast moving and fast paced. Yeah. It sounds really good. Sounds really good. And then you've got a, his second book. Yeah. I was just thinking, though, before we go to the second book, that oh. I, I like the fact that um, that your character is flawed because we all are, aren't we? And mm -hmm. A lot of people have to deal with PTSD, you know, not just people that have been in military action, but a lot of people have PTSD. Before we go to the second book, yeah, <clears throat> why don't we do the book giveaway? Because okay, that will okay. be the first book anyway. All so. right. All right. So let right. me get your typing fingers ready, everybody. <laughs> Let's do tumbles. There. There. Here we go. All right. So first of all, before you get that going <laughs> we never put this up you, no, no. uk author tom Bowles. Yeah. <laughs> let yeah. me tell you how to reach tom okay it's facebook tom hyphen bowls hyphen author do they need the number probably not you can just um just search for tom Bowles and you'll with find a hyphen him. and two hyphens and an author and t-o-m-b-o-l-e-s and you all know how to spell author and that's a longer number than your uh, than your asteroid. <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> like twice as long. And you can find Tom on Twitter at Bowles underscore Tom. You can find him on Instagram at Tom Bowles 2021. You can find him on LinkedIn at Tom hyphen Bowles hyphen. I know we need this number. It's 092 aa 764. 
And now his email. <laughs> and he can be found on IndieBookSource.com. Yeah, he yeah. doesn't have a website, so you can yeah. go look him up on IndieBookSource.com and find and out all, everything. Get yeah. links to buy his books. Right. And, and just search find Tom, out about his Yeah, books. just search Tom Bowles or look in the author list. And you'll find it. And you'll find him. Mm -hmm. And his email is tom.bowles at tombowlesruntogether.org. And, and the now book giveaway. the book giveaway is the first three people to email tom.bowles at tombowles.org will win an ebook copy of Dark Energy. And that make sure you know that's .org and not .com. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Make sure you get the right email address again, uh, guys. Right. So tombowles at tombowles.org will win an ebook copy of Dark Energy. The first three. First three, you get type in. You guys all have a chance because Chanel is still undergoing stem yeah. cell. Prayers need to keep going up for yeah. Chanel. Yeah. But at least you get a chance. <laughs> right. Okay. We've got a few more <laughs> comments. <laughs> yeah. It's the upside. <laughs> um, Joe Conjol said, wow, fantastic, George. And George Smuke says, thank you so much. Yes, Jamie is a hardworking actress. And Trish Pivkin says, I have PTSD and it is no joke. And it is not. And I just realized I just read those other ones without putting them up there. So yes, sorry, yeah. guys. I'm asleep on my job. What can I tell you? Okay. <laughs> so now shall we go on with the show? Yeah, yeah. Go on to number two. <laughs> book yes. number two. We would like to hear about book number two. And I'll put that cover up right now. Shades of White. A Brad Willis adventure, Tom Bowles. Ooh, explain this cover, will you? What's going on there? Right. Um, Shades of White, the title comes from a description that I once read of Antarctica. Um, and the book takes place at the South Pole mainly, but all around Antarctica generally. And the people who have been to Antarctica describe the, the whiteness as having loads and loads of different shades and colors. If you look at glaciers, the, the, they've got purples and blues in them and pinks and reds, depending which way the light's getting refracted through it. So that, that's where I got the idea of calling it Shades of White. Ah, oh, uh -huh. nice. I was going to so, say, did you go there and research? I no, we didn't. <laughs> but you didn't. I, I, I would love to go there. I'm a bit old to go there now, but um, I'd love to winter over there. That's you, you don't overwinter there. You winter over. That's the, the the term that they use in Antarctica for people who stay during the cold period. And during that period, nobody can get into you. Nobody can get out from the the base. And that's what makes it quite dangerous if things start going wrong. And you know that that's that's part of the the fear that builds up in the plot. Whereas if the base was to lose power um, during the Antarctic winter, everybody would just die. So um, Brad Willis is sent to Antarctica to investigate what they call electromagnetic pulses, the pulses of radio energy, which are so powerful they're knocking out power supplies. Planes are dropping from the sky. Uh, the, it's interference with the, with the electronic equipment and the planes. And um, it's really getting quite serious. So he go, there, there are four, four or five big telescopes in Antarctica. And so he goes as an astronomer to do his investigations. And he gets involved with two telescopes, the South Pole Telescope, um, and the Ice Cube Telescope. Now, the Ice Cube Telescope was used for picking up cosmic rays, um, and it, that's what it should search is used for. But he, he actually uses the detectors on it to pick up this electromagnetic impulse, and because the clock on the telescope is so accurate, it's accurate to sort of two nanoseconds in time. And I know this is accurate, by the way, this is, the astronomy is 100% true. He can use the sensors in the telescope to work out the direction from where the pulses are coming from. 
And that starts his story off. So he goes off and sort of searches to find it. That's and in a way, they're sabotaged. They try and sabotage the telescope. They try and poison him. There's a couple of murders. Um, <laughs> and the whole thing sort of builds up to a big crescendo again at the end. So, so I love this. This is um, These are murder mystery books, and the hero is an astronomer. And he uses astronomy to help solve what's going on in shades of light. And I imagine in dark energy also, that's the exactly. whole point. Yes. And that is so yeah. cool. And I think you also describe them as techno thrillers, right? Techno thrillers, because there is yes. so much technology yeah. in them. Okay, Joe Conjol says, love that cover. It is, it's really good. For shades of white. Yeah. And mm -hmm. shades of white. And then Trish Pipkin says, that cover gives me the thing vibes. Yeah, it I does, love it. right? <laughs> Thing vibes. I've never heard of that before. And oh, she, the, and uh, Becca Jones says, "Great cover." Okay, the thing was a movie that took place in Antarctica. It's, I remember. I know it now. I know it. Yeah. Okay. So she said it's reminding her of that. Is what she meant by that. And uh, Ghislaine McCann said, "You are never too old, Tom, because you said you were too old to go to Antarctica." But I'm with him. Yeah. I think it's because he means <laughs> he would be stuck there once he went in to winter over. He yeah. would be in there until the bitter end of yeah. winter. If you could just drop in, spend a couple of days <laughs> and leave, you know, maybe you'd be good at that, right? But, <laughs> but well, it's a just, long trip, too. <laughs> just to get to Antarctica, you need to be pretty fit and pretty yeah. young. And you need to be able to do two or three jobs. You can't just go away there and say, I'm going to be an astronomer. You need to back up and be a cook or a motor mechanic or a plumber or something. Everybody's got two or three jobs to keep the stations going. And so I, I reckon I'd be pretty useless at that. So well, you I, could be an astronomer and, a, and an author. Uh -huh. I don't and think there's much demand for authors in Antarctica. <laughs> well, this one you could do. <laughs> you could yeah. tell bedtime stories. You could tell bedtime the stories. There you go. Yeah. That's it. In case the thing came Everybody on. happy. Genevieve Andrews Kelly said, hi, hi friends. Hello, Genevieve. We miss you. We yes. love you. I hope you enjoyed New Orleans. Uh-huh. Mm -hmm. New Orleans. New Orleans. Joe Conjol says, it reminds me of a normal Syracuse winter day. <laughs> <laughs> there you go. And George Dismuke says, the original The Thing was shot in the 50s and James Arness was the creature. That's right. That's right. Good old he James. was indeed. And then what's his face? And he's one of my favorite actors. I can't remember, but he did the sequel. He was on Stargate. Help me out, Trish. The original Stargate. I don't and remember. James Ricard uh, seconds James the motion Richard there. Says James yeah. Arness was the monster in the original thing. Yes, he was. A giant carrot. No. No. That was a different one. <laughs> that was a different one. But he was a giant carrot. But that was him yeah. too. That was great too. <laughs> Oh, oh my goodness. goodness. Okay. Well, you know, it's actually time for our next uh, commercial oh, break. All right. We went a little long in the first part. Okay, okay. So we're going to take another short break and then we will come back and talk to you some more. This is so much fun. Yeah. Think up questions now. Anybody have questions for Tom? So, all right. So, we know a little bit about his books. I want to hear about what he's doing in the meantime. So, we will be back in two minutes. Don't go away. Just quick mer. Many secrets are hidden within the darkness of the jungle. Behold, this one about a man, a woman, a black jaguar, and an ancient Maya legend. Two Faces of the Jaguar is a novel by George Dismukes that will take you deep into the jungle and capture your imagination until the last word. Two Faces of the Jaguar is book one of a trilogy. Two faces of the Jaguar, where only the adventurous dare to read. Two Faces of the Jaguar, The Lost City, and The Jaguar's Quest are available on Amazon.com, Barnes and Noble, and many other bookseller websites. Two Faces of the Jaguar, the book people are talking about. Get your copy today.
This award-winning thriller has it all. Murder, political intrigue, mob revenge, and a bit of romance. Not to mention strong female and male characters with a storyline that could be tomorrow's headline news. Now for a quick peek into our story. To help solving a nationwide plot involving the assassination of several U.S. Senators, the O'Rourke team is called in. To complicate matters, they now have to work against the clock to rescue one of their own. You see, the mob didn't take too kindly to the O'Rourke team's involvement last spring. It seems to have led to the indictment of their boss. Will they succeed? And we're back again. Yes. Wow. And we have some more um, more comments. More here. comments. Let's see. We have James Arness was the original. Um, James Ricard said Kurt, Kurt, Russell Kurt Russell was in the remake, but I was thinking of James Spader. And Trish said, which Stargate character could you ask that again? I was talking about Daniel Jackson in the movie. And George Dismuke said, my third wife auditioned for the thing, but she was too <laughs> scary. <laughs> This poor third wife. <laughs> Devra. I named one of my scary looking zombie dragons after her. Like I told him I would. <laughs> so Tom, what's next on your uh, agenda, agenda for the series? Um, well, I'm, I'm working on a third book. I, I've got a working title at the moment, which is called A Surfy of Murder. But I, I'm not 100% happy with that title. It's, it seems a bit clunky, so I'm I'm still sort of struggling to see if I can change it. But the the, the third book sort of sees Brad Willis. Well, let me let me finish off at the end of the second book. At the end okay. of the second book, he goes to visit a a psychiatrist in Saint Petersburg, and. Um, he gets hypnotized uh, and gets a, gets drugged and hypnotized as part of the treatment. And while he's under the state of hypnosis, he remembers some of the numbers on the registration plate of the car. And um, so he comes back and he starts to use that in the third book to trace the car. So as you could imagine, he finds the car, he finds the, the driver of the car, and that leads them into a whole plethora of problems and crime. It, it comes in contact with a, a British, British member of parliament who has been threatened. Um, and then he gets involved with smuggling, murders, and heaven knows what else. And he leads all the way up the chain until he gets to the highest levels of British society. And that's where he starts to find the culprits that are causing all this chaos. Um, so the the third book doesn't travel so much as the first two books. I mean, the geography is a bit more restricted. It's all taking place um, in the UK. So, um, oh, but it's um, I, I guess it leans more on a sort of detective come murder investigation than a sort of the spy type thing that you've got before, yeah? But he still goes undercover and, and investigates, and he still has the help of MI, MI5 in this case because it's inside the country. It's at home. Mm -hmm. and, um, and the Metropolitan Police as well. So um, he's working with a team. And, and it, it can, I should have said the whole way through the book, he met up in the, first, the, end of the middle of the, th the first book, he meets up with an old university girlfriend called Sophie. So there's a little bit of romance starts to build there. Finally. And, yeah, <laughs> it was all the way through the second book and into the third book. And so the people that sort of like a little bit, I mean, it's not heavily into romance. It's not a romance book. But there's enough just to sort of whet the appetite a little bit if, if yeah. anybody likes that little touch of romance. Uh, and in the first book, there's, there's quite a hot scene in, in a hotel in Munich, um, which, whoa, well, <laughs> my, my, 
I wrote it and my wife Rita read it. She said, You can't say that. She says, <laughs> No, it's not, it's too soft. She says, oh. Other books are a little more sort of racy, feisty than that, you know. So she, she, she sort of changed it a little bit. So, <laughs> yeah, I've heard it yeah, yeah there you go. blame that on Rita, not on me. Okay, okay, it was Rita's fault. Everybody. When does that come out in about three weeks? Did you say or? Uh, that's the third book. It'll be three or four weeks. Yeah. Three or four weeks. Okay. Yeah, I, I'm, I'm waiting in the cover, but I've stopped the cover getting designed now because I'm still messing around in my brain with the title. Well, as soon as so you get the cover. Three weeks you're, after the design, the title it, will be. You're yeah. going to give us the cover as soon as for, you get that, and we'll put for, it on your uh, page on yeah. Indie Bookstores. Yeah. I certainly so, will do. For those of you who don't speak Scottish English, <laughs> it's surfed of murders <laughs> meaning an excess of murders yeah cw hawes said why did you choose techno thrillers instead of sci-fi um I, I i guess normal thrillers and espionage type stories are what i read most in the, the, my own choice of books um, I, I do read sci-fis, I mean, but they tend to read the classical ones, like Asimov and people like that. Yeah. yeah. Um, and I, I, I don't think I'd be all that happy about creating worlds and different creatures and whatnot. So yeah. I, I think with keeping it as a technic, techno thriller, I'm keeping it again to what I know yeah. and things that I'm comfortable with. And that, that's basically the reason for it, I think. And then George Dismuke says, man, I dig that accent. I'll bet Tom Bowles would be fun to have a beer with, maybe two. <laughs> At least beer, yeah. <laughs> At least that, George. Yeah. Good I'm a Scotsman, but I drink Irish beer. I drink Guinness. Oh, all right. Yay. Yeah. <laughs> oh, I, I love Guinness. So, um, yeah, I'm very partial to that. <laughs> okay. my, my grandfather on my father's side came from Sligo, so I've got a bit oh. of Irish blood in me as well. Oh so. yeah, you're so you're Irish. <laughs> yeah, yeah, okay, I'm Irish. You can yeah. tell me the accent. <laughs> the top of the modern to your last. My, my yeah, grandfather you always said, "There's only two kinds of people in the world: those that are Irish and those that wish they were." So you're in. Don't worry. <laughs> That's it. Good. God rest his soul. Anyway, C.W. Hawes said, always good to write what you read. Yeah, yep, yep, it is. Yep, yep. It, yeah. I read a lot of sci-fi, but C.W., I would have so much trouble writing it for the same reason Tom just said. But, um, you know, and George, I think, liked the idea <laughs> of Guinness. <laughs> yes, he said. Oh, dear. Um, yeah, I, I, I agree with you. Um, I know that usually our audience asks and they haven't so i'm going to ask it for those listening are do you um do you know have you ever heard the expression are you a pantser or a planter yeah okay I, I don't think anybody is a hundred percent a pantser because you need somewhere to start with but I think what I do is I start off with about four or five situations that I can see building into a story. So I guess that makes me at that stage a plotter. Yeah. But after I've done that, I just let myself run at it. So I then become a pantser. Because, you know, when I write a book, I, I imagine I'm reading it at the same time. It's, it's just like reading a, a normal book, except it's a lot more fun because you're writing it. Yeah. And, and I let the book become alive and the characters become alive. And the book takes over and things just happen. And as I go through the book, ideas see, just materialize out of the air and say, oh, do this yeah. and do that and do the next thing. And yeah. it all just comes together nicely. I mean... Okay, I've only written three books. I hope it keeps doing that. But every, oh. every time I start balance, starting to construct the plot and the story, um, it just, the book takes on a life of its own. And 
I just enjoy writing it as much as I enjoy it. If I enjoy writing it more than I would enjoy reading it. Yeah. yeah. Just, you know, writing is fun for sure. You start really with the blank fun. page, CW says, and then yeah. George Dismukes has a question. Do your characters come off the pages and go their own way? Yes, definitely. And the plot does that as well. That's right. Because I'm going in one direction with the plot, and then suddenly I get the idea, what would happen if I did this? Yeah. And so I, I, and I know if I do, I'm going to get into trouble. I know if I do, if I go that way, I'll, I'm going to get myself into a dead end, and I'm not going to get out of it. But I let myself go, and then, then I need to work out how I'm going to get back into the, the main line of the plot again, and. It's just a challenge. It's lovely. Yeah, you know? it and is. The be beauty of writing it yourself when you can introduce something and then you can go back five or six chapters and give the reader a hint. Whether, yes. they're, whether they're clever enough to pick the hint up, mm -hmm. it's another thing, but you can leave hints mm -hmm. earlier in the book, which mm -hmm. should tell the reader something that's happening and just let it develop from there. And foreshadowing is a is a nice thing too. Indeed, you know, yeah. You know, Shakespeare used it a lot, so I guess it's probably pretty good, literally speaking. Yeah. <laughs> Joe Conjol said he thinks at times he runs his actual life as a pantser. <laughs> <laughs> I know I do. <laughs> and uh, CW says, "Yeah, you write how you read." And George Dismuke said, "Oops, you just answered that one." <laughs> Nancy Schumacher, who is um, George's publisher, as I mentioned, says, hi, Tom, have you always been a writer or did you come into it later in life? I came to it later in life, definitely. Um, my first book, I started it 14 years ago. Then I, get put on the sh well, I didn't get put on the shelf. It was on a, a floppy disk somewhere. <laughs> um, floppy disk wow and i didn't i didn't come back to it really until lockdown so it was covid that really did it for me so i got it back out and i'd written about eight or nine chapters at the start of covid and oh. then it just you know because anybody starting the first novel it's you think it's a traumatic thing you've got 80 90 thousand words to write and it seems a marathon. And, you know, you, you start to write and you think, I'm never going to get to the end of this. And that's how I felt with the first seven or nine chapters. But after I started to write, it just came. And the, the whole marathon thought about it just disappears. And yeah. now, you know, my third book, I'm struggling to keep it within 95,000 words. Yeah, it's getting, every book I'm writing is getting slightly longer. Yep, and you know the words are just flowing a lot easier, and you know it's 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 a learning process, but it's you know and it's an attitude thing as well. I think M more than just um, your ability to write, it's the way the appro you approach your writing and the discipline you have when you when you're doing it. Tom, did you make up your own covers or did you have those professionally done? No, I had those professionally done. They, they look professional. Or... Yeah, yeah. It's a, it's a UK company that did it called uh, Spitting, Spitting Covers. That's a good free commercial for them. There you <laughs> go. It actually says in the, the back of the book under the, the ISBN number and the, the barcode designed by Spitting Covers. So um, I highly recommend them. They're great. Yeah. <clears throat> Well, um, we can't wait to see what the third book is going to be That's like. That's right. That's and right. And what the uh, title ends up being. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> a Serpent oh. of Murders is good. Of Murder is good. Yeah, I, I, I thought I'd like to have Murder in the title somewhere. Yeah. Because it's, it's, it's another keyword, if you like, to get the book promoted. And um, I haven't done that with either of the first two books. The title don't really give you an idea what the book's about. And I thought I'd change that with the third book. So I've learned a little bit from experience that you need to, you know, put keywords in and use keywords more obviously. Yeah. 
right. keywords yeah. are important that's yeah. that's the truth and i guess i have one more question i want to ask you and that is um do you follow the hero's journey do you follow that do you try to follow that arc that that the hero journey hero's journey follows yes i do and um there's quite a difference in the hero between book one and book three um not just is for his ptsd but for his approach to life and things like that changes yeah. that's wonderful he grows yeah as he should right as we all should as long as he didn't deteriorate yeah <laughs> <laughs> it's an upward arc <laughs> i've reached that stage of life where i'm deteriorating <laughs> Me too. It's like Boy. Slowly but surely. You're not. You're not at all. Um, anyway, um, do you have any uh, advice for somebody who has wants to get started writing and hasn't uh, doesn't know quite how to uh, make that first step? I think definitely write what you know. Um, don't be too worried about the marathon, the size of the task. Because once you start the task, it gets simplified and it breaks itself down. It's like the old adage, how do you eat an, how do you eat an elephant? That's a bite at a time. Just go in there and do it. Okay. Um, keep at it. And write for yourself. You know, I don't write for an audience. I write for what I want to read and what I want the story to be. No offense, uh, audience. No, no, yeah. do write for yourself. <laughs> yeah, I, yeah, I do. And yeah. you know, if, if I if, if people don't like the book, then tough on me and tough on them. But I can only write what I like and what I right. like. Right, right. Yeah. And you're uh, writing just to write, yeah. not to become a millionaire. You're writing to yeah. write, and that's why yeah. you should write because you yeah. love to write. You Never write, to write to become a millionaire. No. no, that won't happen. That is not going to happen. <laughs> that's that's going to go bad real quick. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, I, I agree with you. You you write for yourself because you have to write, because you want to write, because it's fun to write, because the characters are telling you to write. They've got more story to tell <laughs> and yeah. all of those reasons. But um, yeah. Even like you said, how you wrote that one scene, and even you look back at it and go, I know that there are some scenes that we've written that, you know, when I've gone back, because we write murder mysteries, and mm -hmm. they've scared me. Yeah. <laughs> well, I mean, there's, and I wrote there's, it. <laughs> there's one scene in my third book that after I wrote it, it's not a particularly a long chapter. Uh -huh. In fact, as the length of the chapters go, it's probably about three quarters of the length of the average chapter. And after I finished it, I sat back feeling very satisfied, but very tired. I felt exhausted that I'd written this chapter and all this action had taken place in it. And I was just washed out. Like so you had done the action. I'd done, done the, well, it, it wasn't, it wasn't the hero that did the action. It was somebody else in the story that did the action. Ah. But even at that, it was, you know, it, it just draining. Yeah, yeah. And so it, it takes all your energy away. So, yeah. but it's, it's it, just, just writing a chapter like that is worth it. You know, <laughs> you, the, the amount of satisfaction you get from, from doing it is tremendous. It is, and seeing your it first is. book published and holding yeah. it in your hands is getting, a getting thrill. That paperback yeah. copy in your hand, that's great. George Dismuke says, if you write to be a millionaire, your boat has a bad leak before you push it off the beach. That is very true. <laughs> that yeah. is true. It is going to sink. <sighs> well, it's getting pretty late over in uh, your side of the pond there. Yeah. He's yes, one o'clock in the morning here. Oh, my so goodness. sorry. Thank you so much Thank for you. joining us yes. and sharing. Uh, you've been amazing and you. we appreciate it. Um, we're going to move you over to the side now and um, go over a few events and things coming up here. So, okay, thank good you very night. Much. Stay right where you're at there. Well, okay. over on the side, but move you right over there. And
This has been an amazing show. Yeah. Um, want to announce you guys that uh, one of uh, Meet the Author and Indie Book Source's own Joe Conjol is going to be the guest on Blog Talk Radio, Fresh Ink Group, um, which is uh, Beam Weeks and Stephen G's are going to uh, have uh, Joe on the podcast. Voice of Indie podcast next Wednesday night, right after this show at eight o'clock uh, p.m. Uh, Eastern time on the 27th. And you can call in and uh, talk to, uh, you know, uh, ask questions, uh, make comments and stuff uh, to 516-453-9902. We'll repeat that uh, next Wednesday as well. But that's Voice of Indie episode 91. And, we'll be uh, watching. We're well, going to be we're there. Not watching. It's a podcast. We're going to be listening. Podcast. It we'll is just listening. a podcast, not a video. Okay. So I encourage everyone to jo join us. Joe is a uh, is a great guy and has a lot to share. Um, this Saturday uh, episode uh, rewind has uh, that'll be the twenty third of April. Uh, episode twenty one is a rerun from last summer. It's uh, Diane Astle and Mike Murphy, and that was a really good show. Uh, next week, uh, on the 27th, next Wednesday night, right here, right where you're at, thriller author Frank Talibur is going to be on. And uh, he's going to share uh, all of his great uh, books that he's written. And Beam Weeks, who Beam is Weeks. on that uh, podcast that Joe's going to be on, sent us three books. Thank you, Beam. Thank you, Beam. And he will be on our show. Right. He's uh, going to be on in... Uh, I forget when. Yeah, but he's coming up, I think, in we'll let June. You know. Okay, we'll let you know when he's on. And June, uh, first week of June, he's going to be on the show. But um, a few more thank comments. You, Paul Hollis says, as always, a very interesting show. Joe Conjol says, come join me. Yeah, everybody, come yes. hop on over there after our show. I'm looking forward to it. Thank you, Robin Joan. I appreciate it. You're welcome. Oh, Paul Hollis says, Joe, send up a link, please. Go ahead and um, just... He did it already. <laughs> There's the link. And Trish Pipkin says, great show. Yeah, the link is uh, rather long. The easiest way probably to go is to uh, go to blogtalkradio.com. Uh, and then in the search, just put in Voice of Indy. Um, and you might be able to put in Voice of Indy episode 91. But we have um, we do have it on uh, Indie Book Source uh, on Carter Novels. Um, uh, page on Facebook. Um, we've got the got the link, and you could go to Joe Conjol's uh, page as well on Facebook. He's got it there as well. So James says another fast hour. It was, wasn't it, it James? Was it went too fast, didn't it? It was over before I wanted it to be over. Yeah. So I think that's all I have. Do you have any words of wisdom or pearls or nuggets of no anything? No. I did last week, but this week I'm I'm done. <laughs> <laughs> You're done. Yeah. Okie dokie. Well, <laughs> we are going to say until next time. That's all, folks. Thank you for joining us here on Meet the Author. Make sure you stay up to date with our show by clicking like, follow, and share. And you can find us on Spotify, iTunes, and more. See you next time on WLFE dash DV dot com. You've been listening to WLFE dash DB dot com, where our shows are your shows. <laughs>